Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. Thanks so much for listening. I'm your host, Eric Christensen, and you can track me down on LinkedIn as well as reallifepharmacology.com. You can hit the contact button there, shoot us a message. Uh, be sure you go to reallifepharmacology.com, uh, snag your free uh, 31-page PDF on the top 200 drugs. I provide a lot of clinical pearls within that document, so definitely go check that out. Take advantage of that uh, absolutely for free and for uh, following uh, the podcast here. So today, I'm going to cover Silostazol. The brand name of this medication is Pletol. And from a mechanism of action standpoint, this drug inhibits the action of phosphodiesterase 3. Okay, so you're probably wondering why is phosphodiesterase 3 important? Phosphodiesterase 3 breaks down cyclic AMP. And when we use cellostazole, which inhibits or blocks the action of that enzyme, we end up with uh, preserving cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP works uh, to prevent platelet aggregation as well as uh, promoting vasodilation. So those two uh, effects can be beneficial in the setting of uh, intermittent claudication, typically associated with peripheral vascular disease. That is the primary use uh, that I see this medication used in clinical practice. Uh, there's a few clinical quirks and pearls you, you definitely need to know. And I would say those clinical quirks and pearls uh, lead to uh, a lower desire to use this medication because we've we've got some potential issues with with drug interactions and, and contraindications. So uh, the main beneficial effects, like I mentioned, antiplatelet and uh, vasodilation type effects. So what is intermittent claudication? That's kind of a a term that you, you may or may not know well, but intermittent claudication basically refers to uh, this inadequate ability to get uh, typical blood flow down uh, through the uh, arteries and, and veins. And particularly, uh, that blood flow or that lack of blood flow impacts the lower limbs, the legs and the feet. And patients can have really painful, burning, stinging uh, symptoms. I had one patient I, I recall uh, working with that, that mentioned it was almost similar to uh, your leg being very, very asleep. And, and in a way, that is kind of uh, similar if you've ever had that situation where you've uh, kept your legs crossed for a long time or, or something. And um, But you can imagine that pain uh, not going away on its own uh, with intermittent claudication. As we exercise more, that pain can actually uh, get worse, and patients basically just have to uh, stop what they're doing and, you know, can't walk any further is, is basically what happens to a lot of these patients. They're really limited in their uh, mobility and the amount of, you know, distance they can they can travel. So with Silostazole covering some of the adverse effects, uh, kind of generalized headache, GI upset, those are probably going to be the most common adverse effects. Uh, a couple others to remember, uh, edema or swelling, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in the, the drug interaction section too. Um, but this drug, Silostazole, actually has a contraindication in patients with severe heart failure. So that can certainly be a, a problem or an issue there. And then if we go back uh, to the, the mechanism of action. If we remember we have antiplatelet activity, we've got to think about um, the potential for bleed risk and vasodilation. You know, we, we're probably going to be monitoring um, blood pressure in this type of patient, make sure they aren't getting dizzy or things uh, along those lines. Uh, one little pearl uh, on administration I, I wanted to mention so silostazole is recommended by the manufacturer to give on an empty stomach. And with various drugs, we, we do this for various pur purposes. And a lot of the times, it's actually to uh, you know, prevent the, the blocking or blunting of, of food with absorption. 
But in this case, uh, giving cellulose with food can actually significantly raise concentrations. So uh, the important thing of, of why the manufacturer recommends uh, on an empty stomach is, well, first off, that's probably the way it was studied. And uh, secondly, we really want a consistent way to administer that medication so we don't get uh, bigger fluctuations in serum concentration. So again, manufacturer does recommend uh, giving this uh, medication on an, an empty stomach for consistency purposes. So let's take a quick break from our sponsor, meded101.com. If you're looking for pharmacist board certification study material, NAPLEX, geriatrics, ambulatory care, medication therapy management, or pharmacotherapy, definitely go check out our resources at meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E. We've also got uh, access to clinical books with case studies, drug interactions, a really a great clinical uh, resource uh, to really help you get some more uh, real-world, uh, hands-on experience. So definitely go check out those resources. Uh, support our sponsor, meded101.com slash store. So with that, let's finish up on drug interactions. The primary thing I remember with Silostazole with regards to, to drug interactions is it can have CYP3A4 interactions. Okay, so the drug itself is actually broken down, at least in part, by CYP3A4. So when we inhibit CYP3A4, this can lead to increased concentrations of silostazole. So we're going to look out for some of those signs and symptoms of adverse effects and toxicity uh, that I mentioned before the break there. Some drugs that I you know, commonly come across, I guess, uh, diltiazem, uh, some of the macrolides, more specifically erythromycin, clarithromycin, fluconazole is another drug that can have CYP3A4 inhibitory effects. And then we've also got uh, grapefruit juice, which is actually, you know, considered a food slash uh, supplement as well. So all these drugs can inhibit CYP3A4 and uh, increase the, the potential risk for uh, elevations in concentrations of silostazole. Other drug interactions I think about, I think about the cumulative effects. So patients who are at high risk of bleed, if they are on an anticoagulant, if they are on dual antiplatelet therapy, aspirin and Plavix, for example, uh, those patients are at higher bleed risk. And if we add on silostazole, that's going to add on uh, to that potential adverse effect. We're going to usually, um, you know, check out a CBC, monitor hemoglobin, potentially platelets as well, just to kind of monitor for this risk. Uh, if it's deemed that the risk is, is too great, we're likely going to go without the silostazole uh, rather than, you know, an anticoagulant or um, potential dual antiplatelet therapy. So, uh, because a lot of these patients with per peripheral vascular disease and potentially intermittent claudication, they're probably going to be at uh, very high risk uh, for cardiac complications as well and maybe on some of those uh, antiplatelet, other antiplatelet, uh, anticoagulant type medications. Uh, one other additive effect I kind of mentioned in the, the adverse effects, so vasodilations. Uh, you know, the risk for dropping blood pressure a little bit, while I wouldn't say it's it's a substantial risk, I, I would say it's there, particularly maybe in a patient that's at risk for falls, uh, maybe they're borderline low blood pressure already, maybe they're being treated with a ton of different uh, antihypertensives or they're on other meds uh, that can cause, you know, dizziness and, and orthostasis. Uh, it's definitely something to, to look out for. And we can pretty easily monitor that with um, patient reporting of symptoms as well as uh, checking those blood pressures. And then one last one, a uh, very important one in, in my mind, patients with heart failure, uh, this drug, there is a boxed warning that we shouldn't use this medication for those purposes. So 
I think about this medication, we should generally avoid it anyway. Uh, but if you don't have a patient with heart failure, uh, this drug can cause edema and, and contribute to those type of symptoms as well. So think about meds that can add on uh, to that potential effect. Uh, calcium channel blockers. I think about pregabalin, gabapentin, uh, pioglitazone, uh, and of course the, the commonly used uh, over-the-counter available medications uh, like NSAIDs as well. So a uh, few drug interactions to, to keep in mind there uh, with cylostazol. Again, it's not a 100% extensive list. There are multiple others, um, but just wanted to throw out some of the ones that I've seen uh, and, and I've come across in, in clinical practice there. So I think that's going to wrap it up for today. If you enjoyed this episode, enjoy the podcast in general, uh, do us a huge favor, leave us a kind rating review on iTunes or wherever you're listening. Also, go snag your free PDF. Uh, follow our, our podcast. When we've got a new episode, we'll shoot you an email. And that's at reallifepharmacology.com. And then, of course, if you're uh, in the mood for an Audible book or any other resources pertaining to uh, clinical pharmacy, clinical medication management, uh, definitely go uh, check out our resources at meded101.com slash store. Thanks so much for listening. Take care and have a great rest of your day.